Good afternoon. Uh, this video we're going to take a look at a Pimeroni product. It's called the Pico RGB keyboard. I picked it up at the local micro center uh, store uh, probably last year sometime or sometime in this past year. Um, it was intriguing when I saw it and then uh, after buying it I had no idea how the heck I'm even going to use it. Uh, but I do understand that there is this large trend these days to have these keypads, uh, either as macro keypads or as, in this case, where I would probably use it would be more as an input device for the Pico. Um, but without a legend and just having 16 buttons, I am at a loss as to how I'm going to use it. Uh, if you folks can enlighten me uh, on how people utilize these keypads, because I've got another one that's much more expensive as well. Uh, but if you guys got uh, feel like sharing your ideas on how these types of keypads can be used without a legend or a way to mark the keys properly, um, let me know in the comments below. I'm curious. Uh, in the meantime, I'm learning about this device and sharing it with you. Uh, I find that it uh, would have some uh, good potential in a couple of uh, microcontroller projects that I've got coming up. Over here on the Pimeroni website, uh, I've got the device called up. Uh, they're talking about uh, how a glorious, squishy 4x4 rainbow illuminated keypad for your Raspberry Pi Pico, perfect for making a custom USB input device. And I kind of get that. Uh, I love their description. Uh, glorious and squishy. <laughs> It works for me, though. Um, nonetheless, it uh, shows the, the device. Uh, they're showing it in a horizontal orientation, but I think it was truly meant to be used in a vertical orientation like I'm showing it here. Uh, but uh, there are some other data sheets and, and other information here, but most of it you really don't need uh, other than the demo program. And from that is how I extrapolated uh, the example program will go over here. Uh, so we'll, from here, we'll dive right over to Thani and uh, scroll down, look at the program. And uh, the, uh, the thing with Pimeroni products that you should always give thought to, uh, and I see I don't have the link for it here, but I'll add it, is that most of their products like this require their UF2 file as opposed to the one from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So um, you will need to load in the Pimeroni UF2 file in order to use this. I'll include a link in this area of the description uh, within the program uh, before I close it out here. Um, in this example here, I'm setting it up, uh, uh, an example on how you'd use this for latching keys, meaning that you press the key, it stays on. So you're setting a state on, kind of like a toggle switch or a rocker switch, where you press it, it stays on, and then we're going to press it and that'll turn the device off. Now, again, without legends, I don't know what that thing's actually, what function it's performing, but uh, I'm sure we can come up with a cool way to deal with that as well. Uh, but nonetheless, that's how I've got this configured. If you're using it where you just want to read the input um, and not inform the user of a state, well, then you can use the colors in a different way and just make it look cool and all that stuff. Uh, the uh, the each button has RGB LED in it, and you can set the mix so you can get cool custom colors and all that. Uh, the one thing that is unique about this, kind of threw me for a loop when I was first tinkering with it, was the key codes that are reported from the library. It goes 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. I get that, um, but I thought it'd be kind of handier if I just had uh, uh, essentially like 0 through 15 or something to that effect uh, uh for a, a key code number. 
so anyhow, you got to be aware of that, and I try to make sense of that further down in the uh, code here. Uh, to use it, we're gonna, going to need a time library to do some uh, slowing of things down. Uh, and then we're going to import uh, the Pico keypad uh, as a keypad object uh, or, or library. And then uh, we're going to initialize it and then set the brightness up at full height. And then uh, we'll do an update so that it, it refreshes uh, it, it, all the, the current settings. Then we're going to set a variable to uh, the keypad get num pads, and uh, we will reference that later on as the number of uh, squishy keys. Uh, we're going to create a list uh, that we're going to use internally to hold the button states, and I call it button states. Uh, it's going to be a list, and we'll populate it. Uh, with the button state, uh, we'll create uh, 16 of them. Then we will populate it with uh, this color code sequence here, which is uh, equates to a, a really dim blue. Um, I don't know if uh, it would be more of this color here. This is with the blue on at a higher brightness, and that's kind of a dim blue. Uh, it's much more... Uh, recognizable here in person. Uh, but we would, just going through, getting them all set to a dim blue color is what's going on here. Uh, this function and this function we'll get back to, we'll come back to that uh, after we see how it's being called down here. Getting down here to the main part of the program, we're going to use this last key variable and set it to zero, and that's to help us prevent auto-repeating. Sometimes that can be an absolute nuisance, uh, especially with this type of key switch. Uh, we're going to go into an almost endless loop. Uh, we will then uh, query uh, for what key button state is active, and that's going to be stored in button states here. And then we're going to check it if button states is not equal to zero, meaning, guess what? Somebody's pressing a button. Uh, and the last key is equal to zero, meaning somebody wasn't pressing a button. We will get that key using get key button states. And that's a function that we're going to go up and, and uh, discuss here in a second. And that'll be stored in press key, pressed key. So we're going to look at that um, get key function. And that's this guy right here. Uh, essentially what this function does, it's going to take that odd numbering sequence, that odd key code, uh, which from the library it'll be like 1, 2, 4, 8, all the way up to 16384, and then finally 32768. Um, we're going to take that code and then we're going to convert it into a basic key code number, 0 to 15. Much easier to understand and correlate to a keypad layout such as we have here. And then also, based on that key number, we're going to give it a color, a set of color code for it. And the way I've got this set up, top row is red, uh, second row is green, third row is blue, and bottom row is set up as yellow. And of course, you can come up with any coloring sequence that you want to make it look more cool. And so what this whole long if-then string uh, is doing here is it's checking to see what that code was, mm -hmm. and then it's going to uh, set the uh, basic key code to it, our numbers from 0 to 15. And then, of course, give it a color here as well. We get all the way to the bottom of the list here. Uh, and then we're going to run the function light key and pass it the key number and the color. And then we'll, after it's done with that, we'll return this key value down to our main program loop. So let's go up here and see how that behaves. Uh, we're going to light the key. Uh, and this will be the key number and the color. Key numbers will be 1 through 16. I believe that's 0 through 15. Uh, color would be R, G, B, Y, or O for off. And off would be uh, how we would set the state or alert the user that that function assigned to that key would be turned off. 
Uh, and then we're uh, setting this in a global variable here. And uh, we're going to go through a decision, decision structure. This is all doing the same thing, but depending on whether it's in the first row or the second row and so forth. Uh, but if the color is R, we know it's first row. And if the button state of that key, whatever number comes in there, is not equal to R, meaning it was currently off, we'll illuminate it by highlighting it in red, red, green, blue. These are RGB colors, and these are in hex notation. I believe it'll work with decimal notation, too. I haven't tried it yet. Um, and then we're going to set the button state key to R, and that would be a way of indicating that it is on. Uh, otherwise, if the color is R and the button state of key, that one, is equal to R, then we must be needing to turn it off. So we would set the keypad illuminate, the key number, we will turn it all off except for a dim blue. Remember, red, green, blue. So O equals off. And then we would set the button state to O. And then we do that for the second, third, and fourth rows of keys. And then after we do that, because we made a change graphically to the device, we're going to do an update. Now at that point, we would come back to this point in that function, and then we are back to here. And we're going to print out, you pressed whichever key. Now if you don't need to keep track of the state being on or off, that might be all you really needed to do is get that key press code and then maybe decode it and that's all and not deal with setting the colors or whatever. Um, but again, I'm trying to show a potentially useful way of using this that I see an application for. Uh, then we're going to record the last key and update that with the current key. And that'll get stored up there. And then if pressed key equals 15, uh, that's this button right here, the lower right one marked F. If that key is pressed, then it's going to exit out of the loop. And I'll do that. And then what it's going to do, it'll exit out of this loop. It'll come down to here, and it'll print out for I in range of 0 to 16. It'll print the button state, uh, or it'll check the button state to see what it was and that's from our list that we created. It'll check to see if it's off, and then it'll uh, code uh, button state as off, otherwise button state is on, and then we're going to print button, which button number is set to, and then the button state. And it works quite reliably. Now I'll have to, of course, restart it because I terminated the program. But uh, here we are back to a blank screen. And I'll just go through. We can turn a switch on, turn it off by pressing it again. And we can get through all of them and set them however we want. And when we get to this one, it just goes in and goes through and does a read of all those button states in that list. Uh, all around the thing works really reliable. It's a, a very nice piece of kit. Uh, it's easy assembly. You had four screws, four nuts, a uh, little rubber uh, interface pad where uh, the membrane is, and then uh, the keys are all one silicone uh, molded piece as well. So very easy to assemble. Uh, the layout of the whole system, uh, you've got uh, an area where you can put header pins in here and have access, easy access, to the rest of the pins for the Pico. So the, the carrier board is also uh, much more useful than just a carrier board to hold the Pico and the keys. You can uh, gain access to the other pins. So with that, uh, I kind of am looking forward to seeing some of your comments as to how people are utilizing these types of keypads, and then maybe I can explore further with it uh, for certain types of applications. So that'll uh, terminate this uh, video for the Pico RGB keyboard, and I hope you've got a little insight into how you work with it and query it to find out what keys are pressed, etc. Uh, thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.